Silence, silence like the crickets. A national silence is a global silence, notwithstanding all the riots. And I give my hat to my hat off to the people in France. They've gone through a whole year of riots. So the awareness is there, but look at the effect. Look at what's going on. Uh, how fast it's taking, coming on that the will of the people uh, moves something forward. And you'll notice that you do it that way, and it doesn't. I was kind of waiting this time to see whether or not we could look at what happens when people riot. The system is in place, and the system that's in place is immune a bit from this. And so I, I've asked you before, you might consider that. You may go ahead and make a mark, but you're going to have to be doing other things in the field of uh, actual application where you start to put pressure where it needs to be. I don't know how that would work in all the countries. I do know that there's mechanisms inside the United States of America, and I am in communication with other people that are working out the, outside of the, the, this country that are engaging the rules and codes that you see similarities. So I'm pretty confident that uh, if you just applied uh, some, some persistence against the system, there's a, mechanisms that allow you to challenge it, and there's lots of mechanisms, actually. So... There's no really excuse, and I'd like to rather see people, if you're going to riot, go ahead and do those other things or get a, a mass of people, split up your efforts and put a mass of people in places that really start to put pressure where it's going to do something inside the system uh, to change that system. Uh, it's a it's a big work, so we're not going to find things over, over time, and the way I'm finding out is it's not many people actually step up. We'll talk a lot about it. You'll complain a lot about it, but but not, not many people will step up, and then uh, you don't come with the right thought pattern, and, I, and I've been looking at this this week. It's been pretty instructive for me. I don't have any answers for you today yet, but I've been thinking seriously what I'm noticing now relative to the people, the, my colleagues, and what they see as important, and then what I see as important what I contribute to what we do that I think everybody needs to contribute, including anybody I work with. There's a two steps I think that's missing. Even after you have been told of, some, of a subject matter, we somewhere in our thoughts as, a, as people, we've been shortchanged or we've shortchanged ourselves. So before I go too deep on that, I'm just going to, I'm noticing something. When we read something or we look at something, we have a, a shortcoming in us that's not looking literally on taking that information and putting it in pl actually putting it in practice so we can see what we're up against it's a different uh, it's the same thing as identifying the battlefield i realize that i've been telling you but there's a way it's not just like looking out you literally you put your mind mentally in that place and you work from there and when you work from there and you bring with you all your principles those principles are your foundation from which you can identify where the enemy is, how they're functioning, their maneuvers. And so I haven't, uh, I'll stop right here. I'm just realizing now in talking, there's a certain disconnect. Even though people will, may even know information, they don't really understand what they're really looking for in application. And that's the instantaneous part for me that I tell you, the, it's a flash of inspiration what the answer is, getting it done. It's a ho that's like the difference between the electricity, which is almost instantaneous, and then getting a machinery to fire up and do its job. And we're as a people in society, we're in that we're in the f trying to get the machine to run. And, and what I try to tell you actually is that you just pull the plug on what that that enemy that machinery that uh, the the war machinery that they have against you. You pull the plug on that thing. That's a lot easier than trying to dismantle the machine while it's running. And so there's ways to do all that. I'm, I'm still thinking about it. But before I go too far again, this is BTW RLM 345 for those of you on the past cast, post cast, recast, whatever you f play, find you played, place you find this, uh, this broadcast for the blogcaster, which will have all the links and you can go through and read this. I'm still thinking about a way, uh, again, with sound minds over there broadcasting real time. I don't know quite how to work this out to get. I don't have it uh, formally uh, addressed how to get the links out so that you guys could be pro uh, posting them as I'm talking. But anyway, I I'm still thinking about that too. Uh, but uh, here we are uh, talking with uh, with lots of people, and I'm getting uh, good help in syndication. And you, you see why. I just want to thank you again. And Grammy Mary, we're going to sound uh, sound uh, a speaker, excuse me. 
and uh, then we go out to other things also after the fact. And I appreciate all that help uh, on how we do that. Remember, we're on iHeart, uh, this broadcast, and uh, I, internet radio or something. I know we're all, we're in lots of places, so there shouldn't be uh, there should there shouldn't be any problem of finding us. It's just that I don't know that people are truly that interested deep deep inside. They you're interested, but you're not uh, willing to move forward, and you start hearing that you're going to have to do something. And I I think maybe people don't like to hear that part and. Or you, you know, we, we mentally argue with ourselves without talking to each other. And so, uh, anyway, now I don't know what the reasons are. I just see that I think we've been uh, d really conditioned as, a, as societies. It's not just uh, United States of America. And that I see now this week, it's, it's interesting what has to come up to start paring through some of the difficulties. But as I've told you, it's not about what you know. It's how you properly apply it. And that's really uh, the key. I still see that's the key. The, pro the question becomes now, what is the proper application? And I'm noticing inside there is a is a resolution problem that I've got to I've got to work out. How do I get everybody to the next? There, we're really literally the way I approach a problem. Most everybody approaches it two steps behind where they ought to start. Now, so it's just you know, to me, I'll just tell you up front the way it's it's striking me. That's just a familiarity problem. It's just a familiarity of taking the information you find from inside the battlefield that they're using against you, making it real. Don't don't make it a joy. Don't argue with it. Deal with it on those terms, but bring your principles in to show how that system, that thing you're up against, is is falling short itself. And, and as soon as you do that, you pull the plug on that machine. It's it's really that fast. So uh, anyway, I better stop because I'm. I'll move away from where I want to go. Why that builds into certain things uh, is going to be apparent here after I talked about this. Uh, I've used to use Start Page as a, a browser. I wanted to tell people, give people a warning. Uh, it appears to be that Start Page was uh, purchased by a company called System One. The details of its organization or corporate papers are, are very difficult if, if they can be found at all. That System One has been found to be an ad and a human behavior company. And they're pledging to keep the standards of Start Page, but I don't. The way, everything that I can tell is that's not going to happen. So it's been bought. Start Page. I was wondering when this was going to be happening. Start Page has been bought by an ad and a data analytics company that goes after human behavior. Uh, and so it's also been dropped from PrivacyTools.io website. And so I don't. I, I don't. Again, this is just a heads up. I don't use it now. I've got a little bit different. Apparently, a different standard for my privacy. It's not like perfect. But I, I will not really do lots when I start finding even small encroachments uh, where I don't have to. And so I just, word to the wise, I, I'm now not going to use that. I did find a couple more. I won't, you can go, you just research out, get back over to Privacy Tools IO, and then do some research about the start page problem. Uh, and it was delisted. And you'll see, you, you'll see some other suggestions for other uh, search engines. And so uh, there it goes. Uh, again, keeping ourselves uh, outside of being the product. Is being more and more and more difficult. Before I go off uh, too far here on uh, away and then on that, you are the product. Don't ever forget that. I think the news is out that YouTube and Google has now said if you don't make a profit for them or become profitable by it for them, you can be cut out. I want to extend some thought here. I haven't seen many people talk about it. Maybe it's just a, an inherent thought you all have. That means that your all the content providers it will. You know, it's, I'm amazed that some people say, I have hundreds of thousands of viewers. It won't matter about how many viewers you have. It matters whether or not they pass through the ad revenue. And so you, I think you, what you're going to find is that you're, you could have a million viewers. If those people viewing your content are not clicking through on the ads eventually, it won't matter what you're producing, how good it is. It's all about the bottom line. It always has been. Why I haven't been embracing a lot of these things. Maybe up until now to my detriment, because I guess I could have probably pulled in quite a following and money and, and, and exposure had I went the other way. But at any rate, I don't know. It's not a. It's not something I'm. I, I chose a long time ago because I could see this part coming. It was all written. So just a word to the wise of the content providers: be be real, real careful that you don't be buy into you. You lull into what you think your own success is. It's not about you. It's about your whether or not what you bring to the to the company. Uh, Google or YouTube is going to make them money. It always has been, but now they're starting to tell us that. And so um, you better find other places like BitChute. And I rarely talk about BitChute, 
but we're on BitChute too, folks. I, I just remembered that. Don't know what that all means. I just that's where we are. So content providers start looking for alternatives. Back your stuff up on other systems. Now BitChute's a bit different because it's a, like a somewhat like a peer-to-peer -peer seeding type condition. So it's uh, got a little bit more potential sustainability, if I can say the word sustainability in the word of uh, sustained uh, appearance on the internet, given that the people that run that uh, hold on and want to continue that their their initial their initial offering for people. So, a word to the wise there. Let me move on now. What we talked about here with all this uh, data, big data, all this, um, we went, remember, smart. Smart's not too intelligent. Uh, I want to point out, a story came out. I don't know if many people picked up on it. Remember I say smart, it's S-M-A-R-T. You know, smart cities and smart this and smart that. What it means is sustainability, mitigation, adaption, resilience, and transformation. Through that process right there, those those few words, those five words tell you the process that they're undermining your whole nation. And it doesn't matter in the United States. It's everywhere. It's global. It's also attached to the rule of law, which is the Bar Association. It, more importantly, its implementation is through the university system. And, some, and so I wanted, a story came up, and I don't know uh, whether or not it, it made uh, much news anywhere, but it certainly hit us, uh, well, it, it confirmed the war that I am in almost daily with the, my colleagues relative to land law, uh, public land use, uh, not even public land, I'm talking land law, I'm talking inside your public, uh, your land use policies are the same thing, they're all part of the same thing, but th you have to understand how far this has gone, those are Way back in the 70s, those were institute, put, in, put in the states and instituted in the states, land use laws. They're a violation, ultimately, to your patent, and uh, so I've talked to you about this. But So this is a deep-seated uh, cancer in this country relative to this story that pops up. But uh, here is a confirmation, a little glimpse of the peop type of people that you're involved in. Uh, now, let me add, add something. A lot of people in cities may not think that they're, they have anything to think about here. This is coming from a Berkeley University a statement uh, from a student teacher. Berkeley is one of the hubs of the implementation. There's quite a few across the country. The mentality of these people in the, what they call the urban-rural divide, which they invented, and now my colleague has now outed, they now are denying they even, that it even exists, yet they still promote it. The people that you're, we're dealing with that Pull out, put out across the nation through all the different institu institutions the oppression that you may or may not be aware of or that you feel you know and you complain about is, is stated in this interesting little insight that was just put on the internet relative uh, to uh, this urban rural condition and the thought of people inside the urban areas these smart areas, all right, these people, these agenda areas, inside the university system, what they think of you all. And you, those of you that are in the city don't feel, you feel a different pressure, but you're the ones that are agreed to them because you had, you conformed yourself or found yourself into these smart areas. Not so intelligent, but they're smart as heck. And they, they you're okay because you're within their sphere, uh, their sphere of influence, direct influence. What they're trying to do now is go, and we've got it redefined now. For, they actually admitted to it, even though they're still lying. Uh, they really don't have an, an authority outside urban growth areas, but that's a fraud too. Notwithstanding that, they're trying to reach out across into what they call rural areas. We've, we've looked at it and said, no, that's really more the countryside and the country folk. The word rural is a derogatory term. The people that you don't know you're up against, that we are up against all the time, have now Someone, one of their people came out and told us how how really deficited they are. Their real attitudes about people who don't conform to their belief system. Uh, this is critical to get, critical to understand. Some of you don't care. If you don't do anything, you probably don't care. You really need to care. I'm just telling you, everything we did. And, and another thing that came up this week was four different projects that are, we are working on all pointed back to land use provisions and the adulteration of your life through these people and their attitude against you wherever you are. If you're inside the urban growth area, they want to control you absolutely. If you're outside, they want to come and take control of you. Now we're talking actually about, and this ends up being an interesting problem for this guy. He tried to make a statement that he thought he was so smart in deriding 
the rural folk, the rural country people, for what they do, as if uh, the the urban areas are self-sufficient. They're not even self-reliant, let alone self-sufficient. Forgetting as well, and this is where we I bring what I do uh, to my help my colleagues, understanding when they deny this urban-rural divide, that they're reaching out across, it's across the country, folks, with these stupid policies of the universities, these crimes against you. Uh, they denied that they do it. We found that they're lying. Then they did that because they're trying to lock uh, my colleague out through a, a status that he has through the mining district as a coordinator. They're trying to lock him out so he can't influence their uh, invasion, the silent invade, transparent invasion. And I, was, uh, my view, look, I, the way I do this and look at it, I was able to show him how they were trying to make his position irrelevant to their authority. Uh, if you start, as I told you before, understanding your uh, nation is separated out like a class society uh, your, by economies, the primary economy, secondary, and tertiary, you'll start understanding more of what I look at when I'm looking at how when they start to make a cover-up condition to try and keep them protected from the invasion, the, the, the crime they're doing, my view is to see what's the limitations on even that where they tried to close the door of my colleague relative to his witness of this crime and being part of the record to out it, they tried to shut the door. I brought, came in and exposed to him the only remaining thing that uh, we have as a mining district and the coordination power was that they these people don't understand about production. They deride it. They actually do not even agree that it's valid as a, as a de and they're dependent on it, uh, that this little story will come up and tell you that with their attitude about people generally, that I said the only way you can get in now because they're trying to close the door is to find relevance to the mining district. And the mining district's relevance is to protect producers. Having an urban growth boundary, which is a fictitious uh, bo border relative to land law, it's a fraudulent imposition actually when they start to cause a harm, we show that their decisions, they try to close out he was strictly production. The economic development monies do not t aren't supposed to touch production, even though we know they adversely affect it. That was the throughput. I said, you have to position yourself as uh, the producers inside the urban growth boundary may be adversely affected, and by these points are adversely affected, that you still have a say after they tried to shut the door. Now, I just went through a couple steps there. If you hadn't thought that's how this works, that's the, that's the disconnect I'm telling you about. That was one of them I, found, I identified this week. That you have to find, these people are trying to cloister themselves and still attack you. You have to find uh, weaknesses in their defenses as well. And you won't, you, none of you will understand what I'm saying until you go read the black and white and have a focus of something to go do, make something wrong to make right. Yeah, I just know that. If you do, if you're one of those special people, great. I want to hear about you anyway because I need your help because you're probably kind of more like me. And we need to have more of this insight getting out. Uh, the point, getting back to this article that we're talking about, how these UC, these these uh, university people think you are, it's also in the Bar Association. They don't think you're worthy at all, and they don't uh, accept a dependence on what you will do in your life at all, uh, that you're just a subject to them. Uh, to get inside the gates of their, their, I call it their citadel, their university is a citadel, it's a command center inside the city, that to get inside their gates, uh, you have to show that their actions can still harm you, uh, that, that because of that, that's what coordination is made for, is to make sure that there's that balance as to whether, first, it's not just a balance, make sure that you that the law is adhered to before they put their, impositions on you. So let me read this, this story to show you. This is the attitude of what we're up against. You're all up against this whether you do anything about it. It's what causes this kind of a thing inside the system when you see it. It's causing about everybody's complaint ultimately uh, when you get right down into the nubbins of it all. And uh, I mean down to your property rights. You want to say oh how much you're paying for taxes and stuff. These people are the ones making the policy that increase the leverage funding that they get to do make work policies that do more policies that make it more expensive for you to own your property or make do your business or move on in the world and more uh, and or try to just get through the world. It's this attitude right here. UC Berkeley instructor calls rural Americans bad people who have made bad life decisions. His name's Jackson Kernian. 
graduate student, graduate student, recent, this is recent product of this university system, has taught at least 11 philosophy courses, no less, of university at the university, UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, he posted, unironically embrace the bashing of rural American. Now, I don't know why he'd want to bash anybody. He's just, it's just his country. Why, why does he want to bash anybody? But this is the attitude we have coming out. Uh, they, he says, they as a group are bad people who have made bad life decisions, he said, in a since-deleted tweet, which becomes critical here at some other point. So, some, I assume, are good people, he says, but this nostalgia for some imagined pastoral way of life is stupid, and we should shame people who aren't pro-city. Okay, this, I can tell you, is not a one-off anomaly attitude, right? So, this is the problem. You may or may not appreciate this. This is the attitude of those that if you don't come in conformity with their beliefs of the world, you are bad people. You've made life decisions. He says you should be uncomfortable and so uncomfortable that you want to move to the city. He goes even talks about rural broadband and gas taxes and all this, completely devoid of what any of that actually attaches to. He just wants to like make your life so miserable you move into his sphere of influence. All right, so this is, I just wanted, you can go read this, more of it. I don't know how much more to touch, and uh, it goes on and on and on. So anyway, I have a, I try not to get too much into some of this, but, you know, I can't, when these people are such a such a, a cancer, uh, I can't kind of give it up either. So he, I, I I went and I found he had a Twitter account, uh, and uh, he said, okay, you heard that one that one twi tweet was, discounted because he think he said something about he thinks he went overboard well yeah you think but anyway it doesn't matter so i found he did have an account i posted uh, a tweet back twitter back tweet tweet back over to him i said country folk would ask jackson kernian and other urbanites kindly seal off your city citadel and when the last cannibal is ready to leave we'll revisit the value and character of country folk and primary economy, economic production, which your tertiary economic life is dependent. I went back to go look at his account, and you'll get the link to his account. It's gone. Uh, he disappeared himself. Now, I'm not, you know, coincidence, right? I'm sure he got a bunch of, of flack on this, more than flack, take him out. The point was is the attitude is completely improper for someone that's in an academic sense, but it's 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 the new normal, folks. I guess I want to point out. I responded to the fact that he didn't have an account no more to say that didn't take long. At Jackson Kernian, I'm saying his name. I want you to start understanding these people are real. These people do things, and they don't have a concept of the of the, the ramifications of reality. They don't have a concept of what their thoughts might do. How 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 much of a hardship they place in the world, that they're not helpful in the world, that they don't understand at all the basics, notwithstanding their so-called high education. And that was a trap, too. Higher education is a trap. Okay, don't believe it. Anyway, that didn't last long. Jackson Kernian disappeared himself. I wondered if this helped, and it was my previous, my previous tweet. Maybe he'll also get more better schooling from a reputable education system like behind the woodshed, before running his mouth, disrespecting folks. Hashtag academic termites. When you get down to the bottom of this whole thing, you're going to find out these are the people that run their mouth, have no basis in reality, cover that up by what they call best sciences and best practices, have a completely... Ant uh, antagonistic view of everybody that's not them and sit higher than everybody else. That when you understand, or I guess you should have understood, when I said about the primary economy of which the university system and his life is dependent, that's the producers and the secondary economy which supports it. You realize very quickly when I was talking about s seal off your city citadel, he's going to have nothing to supply him and his, his type his urbanites in that citadel, and they will eventually run out of supplies because everybody is interdependent in a nation and society. The idea of which there's an urban-rural divide they invented that they now deny is the very 
fraud they develop to try and make it sound like they have a position to say have a say in your life. Coming with this attitude that they think that because you don't live in the city and your life is more one of a producer, that you provide for the rest of the society is bad and made bad choices. When I've told you before, sometimes people are wired to do that stuff, which means he doesn't even understand about that nature in people. That this is a very insidious criminal inside the system. We got a little glimpse that if, if you think that this is just something you can complain about and you think you don't have a place to make an action against, I'm telling you, these people are a working, warring, soldiering machine that since at least the 70s has applied this this attitude right here. Remember, people are the cancer in the religion this guy believes. When he was faced with the reality, apparently he decided he better bail. He, he doesn't have a Twitter account right now. And it's, it wasn't up this morning. I just I have his link. That when there's a reality that you that you can bring to these people, their whole life disappears, essentially. Their whole reason for being disappears. And I, uh, you, you have to appreciate, I'm not just pointing this guy out. This guy is indicative of everything you will be up against in the mentality Behind the big cheesy smile they do by saying, well, we have an alternative that's good for you. And in a, in a corollary issue now attached to public land. Now, see, this is now the rural area includes the public land. And this is where we see the problem because they infiltrate as collaborators there on the, on the uh, cooperating agency side. They insinuate themselves into the scene. And they do nothing inside the scene. They actually uh, take on uh, the credit for the work that was done before they got there, which we just found out as well. A recent wildfire report came out completely uh, inadequate, didn't didn't even meet the order from the governor that it was supposed to be uh, intentionally because they can't touch private property and they were supposed to. And we have the law for that. Uh, but this is a, another thing came up relative to a discussion on the Twitter with uh, Gary L., and I was responding relative to someone saying that they have to have better management in the public lands. Uh, I said, no, it's not mere land mismanagement here. It, it, this is planned, folks. This is from this attitude that thinks because you choose to stay out in the rural, so-called, the countryside as we call it, but the rural area, then you are bad people and you must suffer. And you should suffer until you move into the cities. And so I'm telling, I'm making a comment to Gary here. It's not mere land mismanagement, which was discussed. Maybe they need better management. This is planned, folks. It is planned underneath this, uh, this through the processes I tell you it's done, with this attitude in the UC, UC Berkeley, uh, this one UC Berkeley product. He doesn't understand he's a product. So I say this, there is no actual management to replace the supposed mismanagement here. The producers are any, quote, management. In part, the university system is now an interloper that doesn't aid production but interferes with it, collaborating the very policies causing the problems. So I'm pointing out here, even through this, and this, this tweet I think happened before this article, I'm pointing out even before you hear this attitude, these people use a system to interject their problem, to force this attitude that the, on you that, that you're bad, somehow bad. Because they're in the position of influence better than you, because you just want to go live your life and do your own thing, and you haven't understand how they've infiltrated in the system, and they, they hit all the Achilles heels for the republic, if you will, that, that you were supposed to keep. They are taking the advantage, and they're doing it by this thing, and it looks like it's mismanagement as a accident. This is actually intended mismanagement to cause the problem. This is a similar in a way to you know, the what well, people will see. It's not really this, but, but people understand it this way. The Hegelian dialectic. It's, this is what they they set up. And it's not really that, but the point is that, that you may get a better clue as to how this works. So here we have an insight of of an attitude inside the seats of decision. Remember, uh, in one state, in Oregon, the university system is an agency of the state as well as well as the Bar Association in that state. And I haven't looked around in others uh, to look very carefully. I can just tell you the university systems are now in uh, control seats 
because of this, when they became agencies of the state, they get the power to coordinate and they get the power to influence themselves, uh, make uh, this adjunct policy becomes actually looking like it's legitimate. And so there's a big, big, once you get your, you start seeing how this works, it's almost instantaneous to see where to go to defeat it, but it's not that much work e either to see that you're being taken down. And you get to learn, you, you learn how to discern the distinctions and you also be able to out those that are attacking you. And I'm just talking, I mean, again, this goes, this is so much of a cancer inside the, the fabric of our society. I, I don't know of anywhere you can't go and I, I could find these guys, these people, these guys, these people in their things and have adulterated processes that you all complain about. Don't understand that you're complaining about the adulteration and then you blame like the third party, which isn't even a party. It's this thing that's an institution called, we call it government. Uh, again, the responsibility was ours to keep They've come brilliantly. I have to give them credit on how they used our fallen nature to insinuate themselves. And then because they didn't think they could be seen, they take on this elite attitude. I don't see this any different than the Bar Association. I think of groups of people, and, they're in, and these people are working together. Remember, in our lawsuit, we sued the Bar Association, which gets right to the law schools, through and into the United university system. So we had the university system from two angles just by going after the Bar. Again, we made a touchstone in 2013. If any anyone can go touch the stone and see and, and get the rudiments and foundation that will be perpetually in your face and taking you down until you are run in and considered criminals for being in the rural area, the fabricated area, space called rural. It's just a countryside and you got country and your country people and they think you're bad for you providing for them, completely divorced of their dependency. They've removed themselves from being in service, like the university system did for farming, uh, agricultural universities, mining universities. They moved themselves from service into imposition. This whole thing's not that hard to figure out. There is some insights you have to do, and some of the answer, as I realized this week even clearer, is you, the republic, if you will, is maintained by a mere thread here, folks. Uh, you, we're so close to this uh, this edge, they keep violating even the five-word savings clauses that I find everywhere. I told you these savings clauses are what you have to find to protect yourself, and it's that fast. They violate the savings provisions. If they can get away with the violation of the saving provision of your republic, essentially what I look at is the law of the land, and the fact that there's no government that can come against that grant, given you, you're within the the, the 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 paperwork, the, the evidence of what you have, what you call the patent, has written down what you can do or what you can't do. It's right in there. But that is to you, whoever has that, or the right to have access to it, and I include your renters, then you have the ability to keep these people away. That you haven't, and that they've kind of believe that consent can be derived by alternative and no one says wait a minute you, your process didn't follow and and preserve the savings clause which is all your property rights and you went to the alternative before you had right to that's where you disconnect this thing is what these people do these people disconnect what their actual authority would do within the uh, color of a of a state agency to take you down so whatever they do, you think, oh, that's authority, and it's actually just authority. It's, people, it's, it's foreigners. It's a domestic threat, a domestic enemy that no one apparently sees so well. But we'll all complain that the effect of what they do. So let me move on here. This is not about mismanagement. This is about a planned destruction. And when I say that, that's not enough. I, and that's why I moved over to a little bit more, which I wasn't going to talk about, about the savings clauses in the law. That's the thread of the republic still there for you to keep. That's the last and remaining part. That's how close we are to losing this place. Is, well, either ignoring those savings clauses or watching them just slowly disappear. And so it's not that hard. You look for them. You pull them out, and you defend yourself with them. And so far, in, in what I just said there, when you know what you're looking at in the system and you apply it correctly, it's a complete a complete uh, defense or a complete route. If you need a defense, I'm thinking more of it as an action 
that you displace them and you call them out and you, like I do, you, you find out that they're running counter to the law and it adversely affected a property or an appurtenant right within the property and the right. And you, a lot of you need to read about property, really need to find out what that is. And you need to find out that uh, what law was for. And again, as I've read, I told you, without the acknowledgement of property, which is an abstraction, you have to get your mind around that too. It's an abstraction, but without that abstraction, there's no need for the law. And you're in absolute chaos, which is an interesting problem real fast. That when you don't get this perspective and then be the property, the law, all right, the abstraction of property required the law in order to maintain it. And that gives a part, rights a pertinent of property. And in some regards, they're indistinguishable. Where we get the idea that rights are property. That's not always the case, but that is well, and there's a couple standards on rights, but at any rate, you, you all have to get an understanding of the very basic thing here. When you, I think when you do that, when you get your, the terminology correct and you organize this thing up correctly, like things like uh, con, uh, corporations are, like I tell you, they're just another abstraction, but they do something. They're a tool. They're, they're, not, they're a neutral tool, and it all depends on what's coming on. But get property properly understood. And understand the relationship why law, that that law exists because there is. And the law in places where you have it, at the at exclusion of everyone else, is the thing you need to, black and white, I keep telling you to resort to. You get that law, now has an amendment to it. It's a dangling chad hanging off of a comma. That law is your savings clause. The dangling chad with the comma right after that is the alternative to your republic which is your democracy, or worse, the fascism that you all complain about, is evidenced in this attitude from this Berkeley product, the student who is a teacher of other people. He learned it from other people. I've told you back in 1985, I've read the document, the guru that explained about stakeholders relative to this same system. This is not just something that, that happened yesterday. This is not just since everyone saw Agenda 21. And so, this is a bigger deal, and this is a, you have some ven venomous people inside your, so domestic, literal, domestic enemies to you. They think you're a bad people just because you live somewhere, and they say that's a choice as well. Boy, I'd want to go down to the homeless people in L.A. and say, is this your choice? Really? But he, they, those aren't bad people, apparently, to him being homeless on the streets. Now, it's so bad that they now have apps that, Track poop piles? Come on. Okay, so this is the, 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 the mental damage that's coming out of the university system. Berkeley is one of the major hubs. And before I move from here, remember they're doing an alternative dispute resolution process that the four federal government agrees to in its funding and establishment and funding and continuation of the Udall Foundation. I think they're out of Utah. You'll find that's all the consensus. That's the that's the headquarters of the headquarters for uh, for this whole thing. And so there's a whole methodology behind what they do. They're taking us down. It's really not that hard to see how to do it. You just can't take the knowledge that they do. My knowledge that he's there was just only confirmed. It doesn't. It would never. There's nothing he said that we use ever. It just confirms that we know they're there, and we're not making this stuff up with the people that we work with. Do we walk in there and tell, tech, call him a psychopath? No, you're not going to get into an argument, right? That's not the type of argument that you're going to win. And they're in the control seat. Notwithstanding, you have the power. You go walk around talking to them, making them, giving them air. And then they, they have a, they have a, they, you've now given them the, the, the opportunity to live. And so I say, no, you got to learn what you know is then applied the proper way, you shut them out. You, you, you take away the air that they survive on. And that air doesn't, it's not, it's, a, it's an analogy. It's just something that we don't know in legalisms and or policies and or infiltrations. We tend to believe writings are important, and they are important in one regard, but they're also used as a weapon. And they make records, they make records that are, are tainted by this attitude. Anyway, enough for that. There's a whole process behind this. Indicative of that, you, that that product of UC Berkeley, that he thinks people that live in the country are are bad people, and should suffer, is a psychopathy that is actually pervasive in this country that y'all are complaining about, 
but maybe don't see it that way. So I guess that's. So this builds up. Uh, these failures, I think, continue to snowball against us, and we don't understand how to how to address certain things. And by that, I'm not saying I do know completely. Uh, I'm still learning myself, but we have a much better approach, I think, because we do make the advance back, we're back to the future again, to where a sanity starts to rule again by taking away this venomous view of people. These are the same people that trigger, if you, if you will. And if you go through read the article, you see a little bit of that. But when confronted, and then with the social review in Twitter, he disappears himself. Is it was indicative of this problem. That's how fast this thing will disappear when every one of us starts to really understand better what, need, what we're up against and not that they're there, but how to get rid of that they're there. And then, again, then you set it up. You learn one more step, that you learn what to do to keep that from happening in the future. And I'm not, I never, ever get there, but uh, the, we kind of do that in certain ways, but I can't get there. So... Let me get over here now. So what this snowball gets up and uh, bigger and bigger, and we forget our rights, our property rights. We don't understand certain things. We learn the, 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 the basics. The system has been moving these decisions, whether in neutrality even, uh, that we don't pay attention to. And we take on different attitudes about what we think we should be doing, not realizing uh, that there's a real dynamic out there that you have to take cognizance of. And what I one of the things is inherent in us uh, the rural folk, you get back into law of the land, they have the right to move about the country. Uh, and they get the right to be able to do them things. Apparently, he thinks people who have all that right and those granted rights are, are bad people. This is really just someone who under, doesn't understand how how this society here in the United States of America was made. But he's against it. And what he's against is everything that makes your life what it is. And the things that, not the way we're not enjoying it, but the things that we can keep uh, the republic about that not many of us understand at all. Now, this big the situation relative to, I told you that there are certain imperatives that a government gets anymore, and I think it was it, it displayed to us by Lincoln, uh, is now in our face since 9-11. And I said, you know, I've been, you, you hear me every week, I talk in some parts how to, this is another layer of this domestic enemy that's been created on us, and it's probably the most vicious and the hardest one to deal with, but that only means we're going to have to take a finer resolution on what we're up against. And we're up against, well, we see it in the world. This is the biggest and baddest bully we can ever come up against in the world. And even the wor those that can defend themselves against it. I'm talking about the U.S. government, not the United States of America. Not the people, not the countryside. I'm talking about its government. And, and you see those that can defend themselves, like Russia's or China's or India's that are even on the fence, you see that they can um, at least do something to stave off this bully. Those that can't, as just as I predicted to you years and years ago, you see them being manipulated. And so we have the same reflection internal to the country. They make it look like there's this big bad thing that, that uh, we can't deal with it, yet you find out lesser countries can. And if you put yourself even in the lesser status, that the people of the United States of America aren't the sovereigns, which you can find court cases to say, I'm not saying sovereign citizen now. I'm saying the sovereign and that the government's in service and that the government then takes on this air that is protecting you because of, as I, as I conceive of it, of dereliction of duty to protect you at one time, like 9-11. Then they turn around and they blame you for it by creating you to be an enemy combatant and then enforcing all this so-called protective measures. I've been telling you there's still, um, there's still boundaries that the government must keep and it's then very important to understand where those borders are. The, not the borders of the country, the borders of the authority, the boundaries. And you're going to find that there's a so-called balance that goes on in about all of this. And if all of y'all that want to talk about how much rights you have can't even see what I was talking about, this university kid doing what they do, and that that's pervasive, pervasive in your life, and it's controlling how much you pay in places that you don't even know, why you pay certain things, why you can't do what you can't do, why you do what you, who has authority to get in your face, then you're missing really many steps beyond I mean, the first two I was saying that I noticed people are in functionality. Uh, we get to the border, and now we get to test the limits, because the border is in the authority, direct authority of the federal government relative to the states and protecting it. 
Now, this is a very sharp-edged sword that I think was violated by Lincoln, but that's not reality in the application. So we have to be careful when I keep telling you about this stuff. We watch continually where that where we don't extend beyond what the people have habitually allowed now, but that we still have to push back. Otherwise, you get totalitarianism that we're living because no one's been pushing back. 9-11, and now we come to 2019. We're finally getting court cases that come out to show, yeah, there's been a limit. What I've been asking you to start pressing at every turn. And we don't, only a few people do this. And some of these people that I'm going to talk about here had, um, they were directly affected. As I said before, I think in a prior broadcast, you might condemn Muslims, you might condemn anybody. But these people that are being oppressed that didn't have, uh, um, that were not, not subject to a uh, violation were oppressed. That means you'd be next. Are the front line for, you may hate these people. You can't hate what they're going through, especially when they, it's found out that the government does exceed what it does. That means that they would have exceeded against you. And so this is why I say I don't see how this guy, this kid in university can call people, live just live anywhere, that not where he thinks it's right, a bad people. But that's what the government has done. See, I don't see any difference in the way it's applied. The government called you bad people. It called you enemy combatants in 9-11 and subsequent laws and all this other stuff. So I don't see the, I don't see it different. But we now get to see cases that test that. So here comes up, where's this attitude coming that oppresses you? You're the bad people because we say so without limit. And we found in the university system, he, he found the limit. He found he wasn't going to... He wasn't going to stand the heat of a thousand sons of the public. He says, who do you think you are? He disappears. Now, I don't think the United States government's going to disappear. But uh, what's disappearing is really our rights relative to the imposition of a, of a faceless thing called the government from inside which people exploit underneath all sorts of fairy tales that they justify, make plausible records for. And we have a case now, and for those of you that go across the border, and I'm kind of looking at Texas a little bit here. In fact, one of the the evidence is I have a court case moves my what my discussion from this this into what's missing in the case, and it, it's relative to Texas law, and that's important because you got to look at all the state your state's laws and how they treat this uh, subject matter. But at the border, you're dealing with the extreme. You're dealing with the government that has the the power to protect the nation at the ports at the borders, and they as you'll as, as I if I can find it, <laughs> all my marks went away working diligently this morning to make my marks up and all my highlights went away but uh, you'll you'll hear this the the authority of the government at the border is paramount in that regard we're looking at an issue that is the extremist of issues in fact the border has an exception to your fourth amendment now how they were able to do that actually i don't know but they didn't really eliminate it but they put a standard on it so this is where we have to go that's the reality as I've been telling you, why do you walk in uh, to the border with electronic devices with anything on them and don't make provisions to have nothing on them, go through and then reload? you got the Internet. Why not just upload what you need uh, to start with? Get a word in your mouth about the protections. And I'm, I've, I've offered a concept that uh, I don't see many people saying. It's not stated in this case, but it still brings up the question that I, think, I still think is a problem because they talked about balance between the most paramount right the government has against your rights. And yet there's still a balance. The case here uh, was just decided, and they call it a major victory for privacy rights. A federal court in Boston today ruled that the government's suspicionless searches of international travelers' smartphones and laptops at airports and other U.S. ports of entry violate the Fourth Amendment. And so this was touted as a big victory, and it is at the point of finally the government recognizing suspicionless entry is a constitutional violation. Why are we asking that question? Why is that 20 years later people have suffered? All oh, everybody else that didn't sue suffered underneath this violation all this time. Why wasn't this done hours after the bill was signed that would allow it? I told you you have to go after their policy, and you'll notice this case is about the policy. So it's this is touted as a victory. This is a big one because it's because no one, I guess, understands that suspicionless entry was always a violation. Now, I point out that because I've been telling you, just like the miners get violated, as soon as you address, uh, counter someone, and you affect them in their property, the peace and quiet in their property holding, you've committed a crime. It's that fast. 
we've had a recent court case that said if you do that, you don't have to exhaust administrative remedies because the, the harm has already happened constitutionally. This case is now on the border where the government is said to have paramount authority, and then you read carefully and it has to so much. Well, my problem about this is not that it was finally found out that, that the Fourth Amendment actually applies to a suspicionless entry uh, or a, a seizure. That was always known. Why was this a question? It was, there's, a, there's a provision inside the court case, which is problematic to my mind, relative to the information that was gathered before, which I don't think is such a big victory. The total of this story, for those of you that do cross the border, is one of understanding where the courts place this balance. And again, this is a district court case. I don't know if this is going to go beyond. It was done out of Boston. I don't know where this goes as far as appeals and what they're going to end up doing. But right now, we can go off the analysis, at least, on how you balance this stuff. And we, and I'm kind of uh, loose about how I do this. We, we talk about probable cause and reasonable suspicion. I usually say probable cause. There's a real distinction between the two. And so those of you that do audits or ever get stopped by a cop, you have to understand that the, prob uh, the, the the distinction, and you'll see the evidence of the two parts in the in the Fourth Amendment when you go read it, that they uh, they need a reasonable suspicion, uh, sh that which is short of arrest, uh, but then they need probable cause if they're going to arrest. And so this is what the court case uh, pins on, uh, turns on relative to the paramount authority for the government to impose upon you, for all of all you all that think that you're free. Uh, there are still every. This is why the Constitution. When you look at it, it sounds great, uh, and and but you look very carefully, and you see this was not, this was not such a a free document. It's full of servitude. Maybe like those that you see suffered by white citizens in their civil rights, stated in 42 U.S.C. 1981. So you see, you can see if you look carefully the Civil Rights Act there is incorporating everybody, that you are underneath a servitude. So something's changed, and they tell us that, but we don't want to believe it. We just want to complain about it. And I don't know if I have all the answers, certainly, but I can certainly, we have to claw ourselves back to certain things that we hear are there. It takes 20 years to find out they're not supposed to do suspicionless uh, searches that they've been doing since 9-11. All the people, did you have a, were, all those people, did they, did they, uh, that got, suspicionless service so, and all the subjectness to it. Did, did they get their rights, folks? And so we have a serious, the answer should be no. Uh, you, we have a serious defect in this country that the Bar Association is allowed. You'll find out as we move on through, i got to do this a little bit backwards, you know, you'll find out that these standards were done because the probable cause standard and reasonableness standard was not stated. The Supreme Court has taken the luxury to define what they are for us. And I'm not necessarily saying that's all bad, because I guess they need something, but you start to have to wonder, where does the common man's understanding of this fall away finally? And now we start to see the defeat of the people and the extravagance and exploitation of the legal system where they didn't keep it simple. And I think that's a that's a, an inroad. Whether the, It's not going to be part of these cases, but that's for you to, to consider if you ever get into place to set up your record. Again, this is a point about record, what happens, what they can do, what they don't do. This case is instructive. Uh, started off, I'm going to read some of it. It's going to take a little while. Uh, we're going to go, th I want to go through some of this because I think it's important for you to understand how the, how the court does this, uh, how they, uh, where your lines are. And I'm, if I, hopefully I get there, I'm going to got to get there to finish this off. There's a uh, presumption that they don't speak to, that I'm always concerned when I don't see it. They're saying that relative to the Fourth Amendment, that this case has been decided. And I look at what they said inside the case, I said, but they're implicating many things in the First Amendment. Why weren't those brought up as, as well? Given you're at the extreme border of the government's power because you're at the border. And there's a border exception to the Fourth Amendment. But we'll find it's not limitless. So let me go on here to, to explain here. This is the case now of... A, Alice Saad versus Nielsen of the U.S. Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. You're also going to be dealing here with the Port Authority, the CBP, and the ICE the immigration people. And this has always got me uh, got me a little bit. How is immigration involved wherever Americans are involved? 
in this case, if, and I don't know where I'm going to find it. All my highlights went away. I'm going to go through as best I can. They show you, they state right in here that it's once you've identified you're an American citizen even, just leave it, leave the neutral term, even if one is a permanent resident, you're admissible. There's no question. And this is what starts to touch on what I've been saying. What about that? You're going to find in this case, to me at least, and maybe you'd find it as troubling, that even though that's the case, you're going to find something out about what they do have on you relative to the prior searches that isn't going to be fixed because of a nuance that the court says fixes. This is an injunction. This is an equitable remedy, an, uh, an equi um, a remedy in equity. Again, injunctions and also a declaratory judgment. And if, we can, if I can get this thing through properly, you're going to hear that these people did get, get the fact of their declaratory judgment allowed. They didn't get the expungement of the records that were already gathered under the, under the false policy. And to me, that, that concerns me uh, just a lot because well, I should, I'm kind of going backwards on my thoughts, but I'll do it anyway. Remember all the information gathering that they're doing on the big data. This is this ends up going there if I ever get if I could ever get to all my tabs I put together for how these thoughts come to me. This is where we'll go. That the government's collecting information, even if it's now. Here's the seriousness of this. Even what this case explains to me, unless I haven't misunderstood, that what information the government already has, even if it was found that was done unlawfully may not be able to be expunged from the record to bring you back into the status that you enjoyed prior to that taking. And as I say that, that just triggered another thought. It is a taking, isn't it? Did they pay you for it? But anyway, that's an offshoot I never thought about to even say. Let me get into the case here. Some people who got their, interfered with, got their stuff stolen, uh, electronic devices. Ten, ten U.S. citizens of one lawful permanent resident allege that defendants, which is the government, conduct cert conduct, searches Plaintiff's electronic devices at ports of entry to the United States. Didn't say United States of America. you got to listen very carefully for how this works. These ports are these little enclaves of the United States. You're in the government authority. Anyway, and in some instances, confiscating the electronic devices being searched pursuant to CBP and ICE ICE policies violates the Fourth Amendment, counts one and two, uh, counts one and three, excuse me, and the First Amendment, Count two, the U.S. Constitution. Now, I just said that they didn't decide it on the First Amendment. They mentioned that they had the right to go out on the First Amendment. I don't know if it was a, uh, what I'm thinking about. Now, I think it had to do with their religious freedom, but there's a n one or two more in the First Amendment that I think are being violated that doesn't require a religious exemption, which nonetheless you'll find didn't matter. It doesn't matter that you're First Amendment was violated on this information that they took prior to the suit. So this is a victory. Yeah, the suspicionless uh, seizure of, docu of of equipment is now via. Now we know if we didn't because we didn't know before. If apparently violates the Fourth Amendment, but you're not going to see any support for your First Amendment, even though there's a connection in here, and I'll never find it. There's a connection to other relative rights. And so you, you start to, those of you learning are on the street and you've got to deal with these, uh, these police. The border is the worst case. The police in the streets doing criminal enforcement are not a worst case. If you can defend yourself against the worst case, the police in the street are a lot less of a threat. Not that they're not a threat. They'll kill you. But you'll have the better record being made because you'll follow the, ev the things you need to do to verify or to validate or to give notice that they don't have reasonability reasonability to, to even investigate. So you're here to defeat, listen for the, in this case, and you'll have to read it. Uh, now, this is what I was saying. You read it, you know this. Well, what does that do for you in the street? Nothing until you learn what you're going to listen for when someone comes against you and what you're going to now put in the record, make a record to cre defeat, defeat the reasonableness standard for the investigation to begin with. So the plaintiffs are, were violated in having their, their electronic devices stolen. They seek declaratory and injunctive relief to, related to def government, defendants' ongoing policies and practices. Policies and practices. 
as well as the searches of the plaintiff's electronic devices, including expungement of all information gathered from or copies made of the contents of plaintiff's electronic devices and all of plaintiff's social media information and device passwords. Plaintiffs have now moved for summary judgment. Defendants have cross-moved for summary judgment. Although governmental interests are paramount at the border, where such non-cursory searches, even, quote, basic, close quote, searches, are broadly defined under CBP and ICE policies, as well as the, quote, advanced, unquote, searches, a plaintiff's electronic devices amounts to non-routine searches. They require reasonable suspicion that the devices contain contraband. Now you listen to the contents here. The device themselves is not evidence of anything it contains. They have to have suspicion, reasonable suspicion, not probable cause, reasonable suspicion. This is right under the Fourth Amendment if you think that the probable cause is always a standard. It's only for seizure and arrest. The probable, reasonable suspicion gets them to the, the point they can then develop the evidence to get the uh, probable cause. That this requires reasonable suspicion within the contents of the uh, electronic devices, which you also have to pay attention to. They have to have, so the contents of that is what's being protected by the fact they can't get past the container. Then it goes down and, okay, so this is where I'm going to be a little bit uh, less efficient here as I run through to try and find uh, these things. Excuse me, folks, let me go down go through all this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to go. So that's the setup, and then I'm going to go down to uh, through the document, page 15. Border search exception for the warrant requirement. All right, so this is where they now jump. Remember, we just heard the border is the paramount authority of the government. That, that's the paramount is overthrowing power here. And yet, it isn't either. So you, this is where I keep saying, you got to really be careful on what we agree that's a victory, what's not what you might run into anywhere, what the standards are. If you could protect against the worst case, in this case the paramount uh, force against you or paramount authority against your rights, then you're going to be in a much better position where you are uh, in a place of, of a lesser um, right in the government, which has a presumption of, of existence as well, which I was interested that Texas, I think a Texas law, a Texas attorney stating Texas law exposes in Texas. It's really interesting treatment. I don't like it. I don't like the way they pull it off. They justify it. But it you can see the government diminishes its own, the judges diminish the interpretations in you because they always, they assume that the sovereign's the government and forget that the sovereign is the people. And I don't say that to the extremity. I say that even in a balancing position. Because what I'm, what you're not going to hear is what I'm going to hopefully bring up here later, is something that they say is paramount to even the paramount authority. You don't hear about it in this case, and I wonder why. But at any rate, now we're at border search exception to the Fourth Amendment war warrant requirement. The border search exception, quote, grounded in the recognized right of the sovereign to control, subject to sub substantive limitations imposed by the Constitution, who and what may enter the country is one exception. Previ as previously observed by this court, the border search serves the nation's paramount interest in protecting its territorial integrity. The rationale supporting the border search exception are the sovereign interest in protecting the integrity of the border by, quote, regulating the collection of duties and, quote, preventing the introduction of contraband into the country. Explaining that, in the court case Montoya of Hernandez versus U.S., travelers may be so stopped because the national self-protection reasonably requiring one entering the country to identify himself as, as identified to come in and his belongings as effects, as effects which may be lawfully brought in. The, court, the Supreme Court has cur characterized customs officials' role at the border as greater than that of investigative law enforcement. And there's a there's a fork in the road there for those of you listening. This is the this is the key. You start you start penciling in how and out and drawing how the different authorities 
are lesser and more, and who has a certain authority and who doesn't, how you treat those authorities or how those authorities can treat you, essentially. Now, this the law enforcement authority. It's, gr it's greater than the law enforcement authority that you meet on the street. Explaining the customs officers, quote, are also charged with protecting this nation from entrants who may bring anything harmful into the country, whether that be communicable diseases, narcotics, or explosives. Those are numbers of things that you would have to be able to show that you're not uh, showing, that they've balanced the fact they can go through your rummage, through your stuff, looking for these particular things. The limit is they can't go beyond those things, can they? And so you start learning the, the thing that's been extended to this authority uh, that has the power to cage you, whatever, indefinitely for whatever, and you, if you don't understand these limits, you don't understand how to make the statement that makes what they think unreasonable because they take a presumption that they're correct. Why you can't remain silent on the things of your rights, but you need to remain silent on the merits of their discussion against you and what you do and don't do. You'd really have to ask them the questions as we get moving through here. I'll, I'll Hopefully I can get here. This is a lot of I'm a little bit uh, feeling that I may not be able to pull this off because I've lost all my, my tabs, but we have to understand some of these basics. They give us an insight of what the requirement, what the parameters are, what the game is that we play here, and uh, there we, we get little hints. It's not a perfect paramount power. What I'm telling you is you listen to all these lists of things and you document them, and when you make the list of light items they can do, and you're sitting on the other side of the ledger with none of that, now my point starts to happen and relative to your paramount authority and presumption that this case seems to have forgotten, that you can apply a present at every instance, actually, across the nation. And I suppose across every world that ever, ever um, I guess I'm going to have to say it, uh, ever recognized the presumption of innocence. Now, and as I say that, let me interject. The presumption of innocence attaches to what First Amendment right that's not religion? In the, as I respond to this case. The the presumption of innocence responds and is a corollary to what a, what thing in the First Amendment is where I'm eventually going to bring this out where this case doesn't speak to it and they don't even touch it. And I'm wondering why, with respect to the failure to expunge the data that was wrongly taken prior, given that that data is going to be used in the context, eventually if they ever get the reasonable suspicion of any one of these people, that they'll use that data against them. Anyway, the court has further described such searches as extending to examinations of persons and property crossing into this country to prevent the entry of unwanted persons' effects across the border. Absent more precise guidance from the founding era, we generally determine whether to exempt a given type of search exception from the warrant requirement by assessing, on the one hand, the degree to which it intrudes upon the individual's privacy, and on the other side, on the other, the degree to which it is needed for the promotion of legitimate governmental interests. So, to do this a little better for my mind, I'm going to have to interject my assertions before. The promotion of legitimate government interests I would uh, pro uh, offer cannot extend to the fraud of using national security as cover for a crime or a dereliction of duty. That's not a uh, legitimate governmental interest. And I'm only speaking relative to the presumption of innocence here without getting too detailed. And I'm saying that as a way for you to maybe line item out for yourself and how to think about what they've been doing to us and that this will work inside this government, outside the border, away from the border. Although, you know, the border is 100, what, 120 miles around every port of entry. That means it's 120 miles outside of every airport and the border and the border. So this affects a lot of people if you really understood what they've been doing. And I just removed myself from the military consequence to begin with. I mean, this is how extensive this works. You all don't understand you're under it. Uh, and this is how they're doing this. And this is the standard. And if you don't understand this and you call this to be too much, then one day you could be bit by this. And I'm trying, all my broadcasts are trying to show you they're doing this to us. We're not responding. We don't have the right thing. And you need to, you can limit your response, your jeopardy. The witness you see that the, the promotion they tell you is their authority absolute is not. And you need to step into that if you, as this world gets more and more confined into authoritarianism, 
then you're going to need to be able to become that, talk the exception to the exception. You're going to have to know what that is. Yeah, a lot of people say, I don't need to know anything. F them. Uh, okay, okay. I've I've have a couple dead friends because they said that. Uh, I hope that not on you. And I don't think that works good for the rest of us when everyone has the opportunity to stop this at, at every entry and doesn't, as I've explained to you. But let me get back here. That is the border. Uh, the border search exception is not limitless, and must still be reasonable and subject to the same balancing on the level of intrusion upon an individual's privacy and its necessity for the promotion of legitimate governmental interests is what I tell you to attack. That's the standard. What about, they say, privacy? What about, let me go closer to what's in the First Amendment. What part of this First Amendment talks about something other than privacy that relates to the presumption of innocence? What the border search exception recognizes, rather than a limitless ability to conduct searches in connection with international travel, is that individuals have a reduced expectation of privacy at the international border, while the government's, quote, interest in preventing the entry of unwanted persons and effects is at its zenith. And so let's put this in orientation. The zenith is paramount, but only to where what? It's subject to the legitimate governmental interests and the constitutional constraints, correct? That's what it said earlier. So I'm not making anything up here, and you're, I hope you're tracking through. This is for the entry of unwanted persons. What if you're just an American? All this doesn't apply, correct? And so we start to bore in more on what the because remember this is higher than a cop enforcing law but it's still not judicial and so we have an administrative function going on here so don't forget that because that relates over to your local cops as well when they do their investigative stop right this is the same thing here but it's the level of uh, governmental paramount paramountcy paramountcy i guess <laughs> is that a word uh, is uh, high at its zenith. I will I'm use my own word. There it is. I use their word just fine. The balancing inquiry thus begins with the scales tipped heavily in favor of governmental interest. And what have I said? Work to figure out how that governmental interest is a is a fraud, is a uh, color of authority to d diminish your rights. And now we have this other question that still may be decided, but you now put the burden back on them because what have I said before? Your, pres your presumption of innocence is a violation, that other violation in the First Amendment that's not, your, not religious and not your right to petition and, and all that stuff. It's, there's another one in there. And I'm kind of holding that back because I want you to think a little bit about this. Now, I think it's important this way. I think we, we miss this little one all the time. Uh, the balancing inquiry begins with the, uh, the, t the scales tipped heavily in governmental interest. So they go to governmental interest at the border are paramount. Defendants have a paramount interest in maintaining territorial integrity at the border. What if you don't pose any threat to that? They, they define such interest. They define such interest. That's your policies. That needs to be checked. Uh, to uh, include the responsibility to ensure the interdiction of persons and goods illegally entering or exiting the United States, facilitate the expedited to, and expedite the flow of legitimate travelers and trade. There's one for you folks if you understand that you include that. How is it? There's a question. How is this expediting and facilitating the, my legitimate travel and trade to be doing anything that you're doing here underneath the color of your at least questionable national security interest. Uh, they're, they're going on. Admin, administer the enforcement of customs and trade laws of the United States. Detect, respond to, and interdict terrorists, drug smugglers, and traffickers, human smugglers, and traffickers, and other persons who may undermine the security of the United States. What would they say there? Interdict terrorists. What would they call you? An enemy combatant. When? Way back right after the 9-11, didn't they? In the PATROIT Act. So there they have you right there, except there's still a limit, isn't it? So you've got to be careful on what the power is behind the scenes about this, that they have you fixed. But it's paramount but not limitless. 
And this is where you have to go in, and you have to have this one correct. Defendants further, the government, defendants further cite the interest served by the border search exception as helping, quote, to ensure national security, prevent the entry of criminals, inadmissible aliens, and contraband, and to, quote, facilitate lawful trade and travel. They repeat it. They admit it. What if you're not the first group, but you are the second, and you're still looking at them, and they're still in your face? Can't you at least say that? You're, this is your, your job, and this is what you're supposed to do, so you're violating the first, and you're impeding the second? Impede my right to travel? And you had the duty to facilitate this? Do you think that's a different word in your mouth than standing there and yakking at them about how many rights you have? I, I, I think so, and there's more to say here. I kind of not, there's so much to say. I don't want to start to get, go down those paths. I just want to get some of this out. To the extent the government attempts to invoke general law enforcement purposes, is what they're doing underneath that. The purposes that is not what gives rise to the border of search exception, even as the interdiction of contraband can serve both customs and law enforcement purposes. No doubt a text message or email may reveal evidence of crimes, but that it is true both at and inside the border, but it is uncertain whether the evidence gathering justification is so much stronger at the border that it supports warrantless and suspicionless searches of the phones of the millions crossing it. That is, as to contraband, it is the interdiction of contraband, not the evidence of contraband, that is the paramount concern at the border. Not evidence of contraband that might be helpful in investigations of past or future crimes. The case of Kano recognizing a difference between a search for contraband and a search for evidence of a border-related crime, citing among other authorities Boyd v. United States. And they go on. Uh, the noting that although searching a cell phone may lead to a discovery of physical contraband, such as general law enforcement justification, is quite far removed from the purpose underlying, originally underlying the border search exception. Protecting this nation from entrants who may bring anything unlawful into this country. Otherwise, the defendants characterize the government's interest aligns with the Supreme Court's decision, articulation, and rationale for the exception. And so they're working through, this is, remember, the summary judgments, the cross motions, this is working through whether or not there's issues still at hand. And he's saying, here, this is what we're discussing, this is what I decide, this is what the, so, the authorities are, and this is what the defendant, the government, admits is already existing, which takes away our need to... Uh, we don't have a summary judgment position in favor of the government. We have a balancing test that's coming. Now to page 19, if you have it, if you are looking, let me go right to the point. They also again balancing this privacy being invaded, and I and I think the work, focusing on privacy is short of another constitutional First Amendment protection that you need to have that's not recognized here. But uh, it says here even the border searches are not boundless. So this all-powerful sovereign with paramount zenith of its authority is not boundless. You're going to find this exception in the power of the government everywhere. There's a, there, this is why I keep saying, you have to know this, these exceptions. What I would call, like from land law, the savings clauses. Otherwise, they will, they will just destroy you. And you have, a, have to have a plausible, uh, hopefully successful, prevailing rationale. And this also shows us how we don't have uh, the free, we're, we are the freedom. We are you know, a range of constraint inside, or a, a range of motion inside a frame of constraint. And if you don't want to, if you just want to throw that out and say, oh, you're just free, you're going to lose. I'm just going to say you're going to lose. But if you don't come at it like this, you're going to lose. I, and you see the evidence of it. It's not even my, it's not even an opinion. That's just fact. Every border search, even border searches are not boundless. And so we have this condition going on. Now, what I, again, they don't speak to this two things that I'm uh, addressing. I've spoken of it. One, the presumption of innocence. And I've also intimated that what if you're not in any of one of those things? If you're not in any of that and that's their only, their only thing, then you get to, you should be having, I guess I'll have to advance it here now. 
your question is, do you have evidence that I am not presumed innocent? Okay, so I think that's a really powerful question. If it's not, if even border searches are not boundless and they're constrained by something, and you have the presumption of innocence on your side, and they need reasonable suspicion, then you need to take away their suspicion, don't you? That I think the question, it's not a question, it's really a, a passive demand. Do you have evidence that I'm not presumed innocent? Is a very poignant question to be presented. The failure to articulate the basis for the non-existence of the presumption is all the point. Even border searches are not boundless. When applying exceptions to the warrant requirements, courts must determine whether the search at issue is within the scope of the exceptions, i.e., whether the search furthers the underlying purpose of the exception, and whether the search, if within the scope of the exception, intrudes upon the competing privacy interest to such an extent that a warrant or other heightened level of suspicion should still be required. And so here we have, there's another trick here, there's another lever that can be switched in your favor, given you can uh, submit the question, right? You eliminated the, if you eliminate the ability to have the reasonableness standard apply, there can be no reasonableness applied because there's a presumption against all reasonableness. For one instance, I'm an American, I have the right to come in. Admissibility is already admitted. It's not a question. Now we take away some of their stuff. If you don't know those things are required and remove any exception attachment to you, they'll attach it. And we know that because they've attached it to 20 year, almost 20 years worth of people, victims, against a government that's presumed to be right in every action it does. Another presumption, if you don't think your life is run by presumptions. If you think that your mere complaint against these writing presumptions is enough, you're, you're a deluded uh, American that doesn't maybe deserve what they handed us and what we are to keep, and I think we lost, but uh, we can get it back because it's all written. See, it's all black and white. These titles, these things, these evidences of the rights don't go away when they're written. That's why they're so powerful to have written. But let me get on. Undisputedly, interdiction of inadmissible persons and goods are legitimate governmental interests at the border. Plaintiffs do not dispute that CBP and ICE officers have the unenviable task of screening over one million travelers per day. Even so, the record that recites, quote, searches and electronic devices at the border have successfully uncovered threats of national security, information pertaining to terrorism, illegal activities, contraband, and the inadmissibility of people and things without explanation of the frequency, nature of the same, or the manner of the discovery of such is not a strong counterweight to the intrusion of personal privacy experienced by such ser searches. And so there's some more interesting things you need to add to what you, they have to be looking for, that when you understand them as line item points, a list of things that are on their ledger of duty and obligation to observe, they become your ability to step further and further away from their grasp. And you have to then bring the personal privacy evidence that it's being uh, you have you have to assert, and this is an indication that they can use data in order to prove power enough to to circumvent, and that becomes your big data problem. You can see big data is going to work against this point right here and take away the right from people. They'll just say we have evidence that this uh, from this pool of global information, this is what these things do. They'll focus on getting the data, and they'll present it, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, and they'll have the source of that data, and you won't. And where do they get the source of that data? They got it from the failure to expunge a record like this that they didn't have the right to collect is the other problem inherent in this case. And, and, and so this is, um, again, a lot to talk about. As I've looked through here, I'm going to move on. So I wrote, wrote run out of, uh, out of time here. I'm going to go to a footnote on page 20. Uh, moreover, the court notes that the CPB policy as to the reasonable, sta reasonable standard for advanced searches, remember they said that the basic searches and the, uh, and the advanced searches are what we're looking at. The court here finds that there's no difference between them. So 
Uh, he's bringing up the reasonable standard of advanced searches includes the national security concern exception. To the extent that such an exception is akin to the well-recognized exigent circumstances, which you've heard me talk about, you're going to have an ex this police power requires ex exigent circumstances. Uh, it's also the the, dupe, the the reasonable suspicion relative to invoking that suspicion. You have what's called that demonstrable exigence relative to the invocation of police power. It's all in here, right here. Uh, this exigent circumstances exception to the warrant requirement. Such exception would remain available regardless of the court's ruling here. So you have to understand if they can develop this. Let's say uh, it used to come on the, the, the police see someone who committed a crime run into a house. The cops do not need a warrant to go into that house to try to apprehend the uh, the criminal. But what they've now done is they now take a SWAT team to go in and blow your house up to get that criminal. So that's the now that's the extravagance of that. But this is how they get it. This is where they get it. If you don't understand how that is, you don't even have a clue on how you might even interdict this, their interdiction. Uh, so such an exception would remain available to the, uh, despite the court's ruling. In other words, if they ever come in the future against any one of these people, and they can show that exigence, then they, the court's decision here means nothing to that. But that would be implying that there is a crime going on, isn't it? And that's what he's, I guess he's saying here with this footnote. Noting that exceptions applies when the exigence of the situation meets the, the, makes the needs of law enforcement so compelling that a warrantless search is objectively reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Noting that the exigent circumstance exception would still be available even if it was ruled that the warrantless search on a cell phone was not permissible as search incident to arrest. So you see this, again, the government favoritism coming. Well, let me bring up this, why did I bring up this footnote? Because they mention, the, uh, they keep mentioning this point about the law enforcement. That's criminal. And so impliedly in a civil case, they're taking and applying a criminal standard. That's why I keep bringing up the idea to you that consider the presumption of innocence running silent and not spoken to in this case can be used because it's relevant to criminal law enforcement. A co-equal, um, not a co-equal, a co, um, the duty and obligation of these agencies, given they followed a certain standard on that track. And so he, they say on this, so going back up a, a little bit here, Although the defendant, the government, the defendant is the government here, suggests that the electronic device may contain contradictory information about a traveler's uh, stated purpose for visiting the United States, there is no suggestion that a search for for uh, same on the devices of the plaintiffs would bear upon uh, admission where ten of them are U.S. citizens and one is lawfully a permanent resident of the country, acknowledging on one of their documents, acknowledging that the U.S. citizen and lawful permanent residents are by definition admissible once identity and citizenship are established, citing the Immigration Code 8 U.S.C. 1225, providing that an alien who presents at the border shall be deemed an applicant for admission. You didn't know you were filing an application when you got into the country, did you? You applicate, you stick it to yourself. So if you think you get nothing going on, there's all kinds of stuff going on that they don't talk to us about. Uh, we should have had, that should have been our, our, our education system. And they don't tell us about this, but here we have it. That the bowing point you need to hear is that uh, once you identify yourself and you're uh, within the rights that, you, that ought to be had by everybody that's an American, you're admissible. There's your right to travel. Okay, they have a certain requirements on how you're going to do that, but whether or not those are valid, I don't know either, but that's not been tested by anybody. So we continue underneath the question. They go on to, as to contraband, there are limits to the contraband that may be stored on digital devices. And, uh, and they talk about that, but the fact that they could be now regards goes back to data. There's no data presented in the case that said that every device would have some, and therefore we have the right just by, by a normal basis to go ahead and search it. And this is another thing that the, the case turns on, is how do you define this normalcy basis on allowing the exceptions or not, uh, whether or not you even have to apply it. It might be something that they have to do all the time. 
no different than every one that comes forward. They have to decide and find evidence that they have the right to be here. If they are, none of this is supposed to apply short of finding something else. And then you see the differentiation. Well, then all of a sudden now ICE is out of it. That authority has gone. The border protection has gone. Now they must be in a, a completely law enforcement capacity where you heard the court and the, and the government admit that was for the purposes of crime. And I'm saying, what if you're innocent of all this? I'm saying not what if, that you are innocent of all this. When did that get protected in you, that you didn't have to suffer any of this? It has not been apparently challenged, and it wasn't answered in this court case, even though they mentioned the First Amendment. I think that had to do the religious, the religious uh, protection, which apparently is not good enough. And so how much lip service do they give to another First Amendment right that's intruded upon when the Fourth is um, violated is, a, to me, an interesting problem. I like guess is just the indicative of our problem in this country. Justice is delayed. It's, it's, it's injustice. And we have to suffer before we get... The government has become so sovereign, it has the right to violate you until you can turn it over. That's just a presumption of your rights now. And I don't remember I'm ever de being declared that. And so that's another line item you would state. I mean, I would, uh, another question, how, how are my rights a presumption that you haven't violated them already? And, and so they go on to why you know digital contraband to define it would be something like child pornography. We get back to numbers. They don't have anything in the evidence. The government, the government didn't present any data as to the amount that, that comes across that they have to check that requires that you check every bit of it. And so they, they lost on, on that point in the discussion here. But again, it's just a a standard that they're applying relative to what the government presented as they thought they could get past having to recognize the Fourth Amendment. And remember now, he's already said the policies had to the policies had to show they were amenable to suspicious a reasonable suspicion. He's saying that it doesn't. So we're gonna go out on a policy in consideration here why the suspicionless search becomes the victory. But as I show you, I've been discussing, we're getting closer here, how it's problematic that they didn't expunge a record that they got wrongly, given this case was saying that the Fourth Amendment was violated the last times they got after these 10 people. And so they, let's see, i got to move on now to, we're moving to page 33. Number seven, reasonable suspicion, not probable cause, applies to both such searches. So here we have folks, that we, uh, and I've been uh, guilty about this, so I'll just say probable cause. And I don't say it all the time. I'm, I hit them both, but sometimes I'm, I'm kind of loose when I talk really fast. We're just talking in generalities. But there's a really distinct, a real distinction that this court will bring out for you. Those of you on the streets have to know this one. A reasonable sus suspicion, not probable cause, applies to both such searches. So you get to the Fourth Amendment, you see it's the search can be maintained on a reasonable suspicion because it says no unreasonable search and seizure. But upon probable cause is the arrest and the evidence. And so they've invented this like stop and frisk stuff out of Terry, the Terry case, where they get to stop you and then they get to frisk you for any weapons that might be a danger to them. Because they, they have to then they have to articulate a basis for the suspicion. Now, I tell you then you you found, you create you you can you have in your mind the questions that take away his ability to form a, a suspicion. In this case, it would be, I'm an American citizen having right of entry. What's your presumption that I'm not? What's your evidence that I'm not? Uh, as applied to what I would say, it would add, I uh, have a, what evidence you have I'm not, in, I do not uh, have lost my, the presumption of innocence. If I'm presumed innocent, then what's your authority? Period. Because I'm not violating, and then this is not a discussion, this is what you know inside, I'm not violating any provision. Given that you're not violating any provision, I'm saying that you're completely innocent of everything. How are they protecting your presumption of innocence? And in this case, why has it become a question that suspicionless could take, and then the, when they t could take, and they did take, and they took the data, why that wouldn't be expunged? Is where I'm going with this, is that the, they use the standard of reasonable suspicion, and not probable cause to the searches. That's under the Fourth Amendment. Notice nothing about the First Amendment applies here, and it wouldn't. 
So we've got to be careful about applying that, but he, the court's not, so we're not going to do it. I just want to point out, if you've got thoughts about this, just don't start doing that to yourself. What I, my inclu inclusion to the First Amendment is that should be paramount to their uh, governmental need when the governmental need is fulfilled when you're innocent. Reasonable suspicion and not probable cause. So having not discerned the meaningful distinction between the current defined basic search and advanced search in terms of privacy interest, Reasonable suspicion should apply to both such searches at the border. Reasonable suspicion is a, quote, common sense conclusion about human behavior upon which practical people, including government officials, are entitled to rely. That's quite a subjective entitlement. But let's not go through that that swamp. Yeah, moreover, with a reasonable suspicion standard, officials are afforded deference to do their due to their training and experience, and it allows authorities to graduate their response to the demands of any particular in situation. Let me interject here. Training and experience is what you go after when you're asking them Things like, did uh, weren't you trained to recognize that I had a presumption of innocence? And then you say, what uh, so what evidence you have? I do not can have that presumption now. I'm not entitled to that. You start to go after this standard. And they graduate the response to the demands of a particular situation. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Those of you that don't know how to search stuff, you're going to get run through the mill like some cattle. Those that do, and you do it more correctly, you won't get beat down, and you've made a record that will probably and likely allow you to avoid this. If you know these things. You speak to what they, I tell you, you don't just demand upon them what you think they have the right to do. They're not going to listen to that. You're going to give them what the authority is going to do to you when they decide to hurt you. And you're going to have those things answered. You're going to put those on the record. Well, I tell you, your, your electronic device now becomes a, a, a witness. It becomes part of your evidence gathering uh, because now you they haven't articulated any re good reason. And even it's not it doesn't sound like it's valid more than a fraud to uh, to overcome, extort from you the rights that you the the property that you have and coerce the rights appurtenant that property as I now respond back to the beginning of the broadcast, understand what property and a rights are pertinent and when they are and when they are not the same and why the law sits there, how it does with respect to that. And I just covered that right there. So the standard is met when agents can point to specific and articulable facts considered together with the rational inferences that can be drawn from those facts. And so if they make up some, some articulable facts that are lies, and you let that, then you don't argue with them, but you don't come up with a counter fact, they get to then apply their rational inferences, all at their deference and discretion. So you're handing over a, a big power when you don't assert that the things they can't do, they're doing in your discussion and as a record. The seeds of applying reasonable suspicion in the border context, now, again, in the border context, have already been laid in several circuits. You can go read through this the to, more, uh, to the more intrusive searches of dig digital devices. Uh, no reason why we would permit traditional invasive searches of all kinds of property, but create a special rule that will benefit offenders who now conceal contraband in a new kind of property. Moreover, the reasonable suspicion that is required for the currently defined basic search and advanced search is showing of specific and artic articulable facts considered that the reasonable inference is drawn from those facts that the electronic devices contain contraband, although this is maybe an open, a close a question on which the, may be a close question on which at least two circuits have done, the court agrees that this formulation is consistent with the government's interest in stopping contraband at the border and long-standing distinction the Supreme Court has been made between the search for contraband a paramount interest at the border in the search of evidence of past or future crimes at the border, which the general law enforcement interest not unique to the border. This is where you start seeing where the presumption of innocence should be affected because we're now talking in a law enforcement capacity. Why I've offered it to you years and years now that I don't see being people put up. Where is your innocence when you're innocent in all this? I guess I'll say it in a shorter form. 
they, they go through and they discuss all this, but I don't see the nice and clear statement spoken to on how that is being reflected one little bit at all. And then we get ourselves into how many years, folks, that has it been? How many years of people going through these, these lines? And, and in fact, when they went through the line and got stopped, that was interfering with the uh, with the two obligations and duties to move, expedite these travelers through, correct? Why? Because you're supposed to be admissible and you're supposed to be presumed innocent. You're supposed to just move right on through like it's nothing. And, and yet we don't, we've agreed, with the millions and millions of travelers in this country every day, we've agreed uh, to such a uh, an infringement. Let me move on now to page 39 as I move along here, trying to get along. And uh, the parties disagree. That was a uh, parties disagree on the appropriate standard of balancing governmental interests in the border searches. This is important because this is where the court's authority is. There's a disagreement between the parties, and then the court's going to make a judgment, hopefully based in a law. And they're going to go through and decide how that's going to how the balance works out. The parties disagree on the appropriate standard of balancing governmental interest in the border searches of electronic devices against travelers' First Amendment freedoms. The first question for such analysis is whether the border searches of electronic devices and plaintiffs under the CBP and ICE uh, policies burden those freedoms at all. That's almost a shocking statement. You're having to interfere, be inter, you have to face off with these people, and that may not even be a, be a freedom you have to not. And that's what's not spoken of here, isn't it? The thing I haven't told you about what's sitting in the First Amendment. Do you have the answer for that? What's sitting in there that... Uh, provide something for you that's not your religious right, your right to petition, the, the right of press, none of that. There's another one. The court noted the motion to dismiss stage. At the motion to dismiss stage, the policies at, at issue here are content neutral. Compelled disclosure of First Amendment protected activity, however, can itself be a burden. Now we're back to that administrative imposition. When you get violated in the right or a property, it's immediate, the harm, and therefore it's, it, it's got its own exception. Well, as I talked to you before, how you move those, you bring those in and you move those forward. Where such a burden is present as an inevitable result of the government's conducting uh, conduct in required disclosure, there must be a substantial relation between the governmental interest and the information required to be disclosed. Stated otherwise, an infringement of the First Amendment rights is not unconstitutional. Listen, to folks. You have a right in the First Amendment, but it's not uh, unconstitutional so long as it serves a compelling state interest unrelated to the suspension and suppression of ideas. <laughs> it cannot be achieved through the means significantly less restrictive of associational freedoms. There it is. Unrelated to the suppression of ideas that cannot be achieved through the means sig significantly less restrictive of associational freedoms. What's the other right inside the First Amendment but your right of free association? It's also the corollary right of the freedom from association. Under and presuming you are innocent, how aren't you being violated in three rights that aren't stated, they say they should be recognized, that aren't stated in the case by the plaintiffs in trying to protect themselves? It's not uncontinued so long as it serves a compelling unrelated to the suppression of ideas that cannot be achieved through means significantly less restrictive of associational freedoms. Where you're presumed innocent and you are innocent, they've violated all of that, haven't they? And so this is what troubles me. I start getting down farther into what this document starts to say relative to the, again, the relief sought, notwithstanding what the Complaint, they agree, the, the judge agrees, was stated, by the, uh, asked for by the uh, plaintiffs. I mean, I'm trying to find the next one. Relief sought, expungent, not warranted. This is the point here, folks. If you have a freedom of a, a presumption of innocence that's supposed to be recognized in the first, you have the right of religion, and these people, they were talking about the right of religion, I'm suggesting your right of association in two parts is being violated. They're all relational. The court said it's supposed to look at it. How is expungement of the information they gathered from your, the, the, inf the big data from your devices that they gathered underneath the, underneath the 
unlawful seizure and acquisition of the information, how is it not to be expunged? But here it's not. As parties of the relief sought, as part of the relief sought, the plaintiffs seek expungement of all information gathered from the copies made of the contents of the plaintiff's electronic devices, including social media information and device passwords. As addressed in the discussion of the plaintiff's standing, the court understands the plaintiff seeks understands the plaintiff seek such relief, at least in part, since previous border searches may lead to future border searches under the agency's policies. That is, as the court previously held, the plaintiffs have plausibly alleged the expungement would afford them some redress to their claims. Still, expungement is an extraordinary measure committed at the discretion of the court. Now, here's two problems. One, you put in the discretion of someone else. I've said never bring a question to the court. Always have an answer if you can. Number one. Number two is if they have a discretion, you better have the evidence of the thing you need to be preserved and protected. And he's pointing this out right now. But reversing the order and commanding executive agencies to expunge records. Although this is not a criminal case. Now we talk about this connection to the criminal case. Why I bring up the presumption of innocence. Although this is not a criminal case, considering the remedy for the unconstitutional search in the criminal context is illustrative of the extraordinary nature of the remedy sought here. Even where law enforcement officers have conducted searches in violation of the Constitution, the fruits of the search need not be suppressed if the agents acted with objectively reasonable belief that their actions did not violate the Fourth Amendment. Folks, that doesn't sound like much of a Fourth Amendment to me. But at any rate, that's what the judge is saying. That's what you have to contend with. That's what I tried to help you address in your records to bring that out so that they can't, when you talk about them in an investigatory stop, you take away this good faith exception in that. This is critical to understand how they're taking you down this way. To the exclusionary rules, the agent's warrantless search of the defendant's phone and, uh, phone and uh, or, uh, phone at the border. In such circumstances, the cost of suppression, excluding the evidence from the truth-finding process, outweighs the deterrent effect suppression may have on the police conduct. <sighs> A lot of words that mean they can come after your stuff and keep it, folks, even though they violate you because they have a object. Oh, they may claim to be objectively reasonable reason. It, it's a. This is why I say you got to take that away from them. There's no good faith exception when you take it away from them, and you have to learn what that is. And this that standard applies to about everything you do against a government official anywhere. This is why you state no talk about the merits of what you've done and what you didn't do. You you start asserting the underlying code and law that they're violating or that you should be protected by the as I said before the. Ex, the savings clauses in the law, if you will, relative to certain things. But like if I move that into traffic without going to far afield, and I say, well, the grant to the United States to me is an exclusion to your authority. How, am I, how have you not violated that and violated the law under, state, under your color of your uniform and your badge and your authority and not committed felony? Is, is, is taking away the good faith exception. You have to know that stuff. And I know a lot of people may have not even, some of you may not be listening anymore and they've gone away. But uh, if you expect to get back what they've put on us, you're going to have to understand some of these basic ideas. A lot of the ideas here in this case you can get pretty quickly, a lot quicker than I had to learn it. And so, I, again, I've got to go through here quickly. There's more to talk about in light of, I go to page 45 now, if some of you may have found the document. Can I even find this without the bold? Let me cut through here. Putting aside the balancing of deterrent effect of the border agents, that expungement of this information may have plaintiffs seek expungement also to protect them from the future harm, more likely being subject to border searches. In the context, and a court in its discretion may order expungement for the purposes of remedy going ongoing and future harm, where such is an ex equitable remedy designed to correct and not compensate for the violation, and may be essential to prevent future harm as a result of the violation, dismissing the claim of expungement in the absence of an allegation that the defendant schools continue to maintain uh, records falsely characterizing the children as mentally retarded, citing Carter versus Oral Carter versus uh, Orleans Parish case. Here's what I was telling you before. The defendant 
There was absence of an allegation the defendant continues to keep the record and harm to them. The plaintiff did not allege these records would be a harm to them, even though they were lawfully taken. Shows you the exactness by which you have to outline what's been harmed in you, and if you don't assert that, they don't give you cor a correction for it. Because at the end of all that, maybe I read that a little bit odd, so it made it hard to understand. I should maybe reread that, because it was an interjection of a court case saying, uh, notwithstanding this protection and this equitable remedy and the compensation that doesn't compensate but stops the violation from the original violation, if the defendant didn't give evidence and has a, the record has an absence of an allegation that the harmer is going to use that information, the court in its discretion can doesn't have to um, expunge that record and therefore at the end the court denies the request for expungement of information taken from their digital devices given the declaratory relief provided below because he's saying now that we get to it, the declaratory relief which is the declaration the defendant's policy violate the first and fourth amendment facially have violated plaintiff's First and Fourth Amendment's rights by authorizing and conducting a search of electronic devices absent the warrant, supported by probable cause, the wrong standard as well, and the direct legislation that the de defendant's policy violate the Fourth Amendment facially have uh, violated the Fourth Amendment rights by authorizing the conduct and confiscation of electronic devices absent probable cause, the court grants this relief. He's saying here, because they're going to have to come with suspicion, they get to keep all this other information they grab, and it can be used against them once the future trigger pulls them through and the suspicion is created. He allows the declaration they violated the fourth, but allows them to keep the, viola the information because in, this, in one part, the, that the, the plaintiffs didn't say it would harm them in the future. And what would that have turned on had they invoked the other part, the part of association that I've told you, and because of their law enforcement capacity, in your presumption of innocence. But the presumption of innocence is tainted with this evidence in their hand. Because they would use it if there's a mere suspicion in the future. So I don't, at this point, I'm almost, I read that, I'm terrified. <laughs> This is where the big data thing comes in if you don't understand it. All oh, this information, they just use it and use it and use it. It doesn't matter if they violate your rights. If no one ever makes a, and they don't give you a place to go do this, if no one goes anywhere to say that that was a violation and it, remote, it infringes upon them somehow that their government's not to infringe, it doesn't matter. As I've told you over and over and over, over and over, I don't know how many times I'm going to say that. And so the injunctive relief is denied. Why? Because they say you're not going to be the, the agency's not going to be there in the future unless it has suspicion. And so you're now sitting on the end, as I keep telling you, the fraud that they'll make up. Uh, like you hear now, I smelled weed in your car. And that's enough. Well, in the states that haven't uh, kept it outlawed by some decriminalization or regulation. Oh, man, folks, I don't know. I look at this stuff, I say, this is what the standards are. Why aren't we meeting it? I think it can be. Why aren't we asserting our rights to the utmost and put pressing them to the wall immediately? And so let me move on a little bit more to show you, talk about this presumption of innocence that comes up, uh, to show you that there's a high standard here. Burden. Of, I'm going to go through some tabs now, some, some supporting information. Uh, burden of proof on constitutional motion to suppress. It's inside a case in a motion where you've applied into the case and you're doing a motion to suppress the evidence. Other than the presumption of innocence, there are few presumptions in criminal law more powerful than the presumption of Fourth Amendment unreasonableness that attaches to warrantless searches and seizures. Other than the presumption of innocence, there are few presumptions in criminal law more powerful than the presumption of Fourth Amendment unreasonableness. Other than the presumption of innocence. Where did you hear that in this other case? This is such a big thing that I don't understand why it's not asserted. But moving on to another another point, just Wikipedia gets some information. Presumption of innocence serves the emphasis that the prosecution has the obligation to prove each element of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt or some other level of proof depending on the criminal justice system and that the accused bears no burden of proof at all. This is where I say you have to ask the question. You have no proof to burn. You just have to ask whether or not uh, how and where the evidence is that you don't uh, all continue to enjoy the presumption of innocence. 
that forces the articulation of the factual basis, doesn't it? If you don't say it, they go out the way they this court case and they ignore that part, and now you're competing against the paramount interest of the government, which they then look to you that like it's boundless. This is often expressed, this presumption of innocence is often expressed in the phrase innocent until proven guilty. The connection here is the criminal law, which the court case admits is part of your border entries. Why I apply it. Why I don't understand why it's not applied in the first instance against uh, a, a mere assertion. An object. Here's the standard a bit uh, based on this uh, this term coined by a barrister, no less. If you don't think English law is still running, anyway, Gar Garrow, uh, William Garrow, Sir William Garrow, insisted that accusers be robustly tested in court. Robustly tested, folks, not just a. Dis the judge looked at. They're supposed to almost, it looks like a trial here, doesn't it? Well, did that get asserted? It doesn't sound like it. But again, remember, they were going from the record that the judge is going for. An objective observer in the position of a juror must reasonably conclude that the defendant almost certainly committed the crime. Now, how are they going to do that when you assert and question their removal or a question whether or not they have evidence to remove your presumption of innocence? And there's a couple of others. How about have they have removed, that they have the right to cause you to associate as a criminal? Where was your right not violated to, to be free from that by the mere assertion? And I've got a couple more links as we move on. Uh, the thing I wanted to inquire about with you all, I couldn't find uh, any court, I didn't have the time, but I looked at a couple of discussions where attorneys are looking at this, and they called this... Um, unreasonable or reasonableness standard by the cops a presumption. I wanted to offer something. If that's the case, and this is an administrative stop, and I told you before, you can order them to say, what's your administrative procedure to give me the opportunity to rebut? If this is a presumption upon their reasonableness, don't you now, and don't you have the authority to insist that they give you the right to rebut, and it's not done without a, a conversation to do what? To attack their good faith reliance, isn't it? You need to look very carefully. I wasn't, didn't have the time to be able to do it. Whether or not this is really considered a presumption by the courts. If this is a presumption, this reasonableness standard, this reasonable suspicion is a presumption, uh, you need to inquire what is the officer, officer uh, offering as the uh, uh, the procedure, the proceeding, in order to rebut his belief. And if I think you do that, you start to chip away even faster and harder at what they will rely on and take people down on, and they're not they're going to have to second second think what they're doing here. Thank you for uh, every uh, for being here, Grimner. What you do at reallibertymedia.com. Uh, getting on the way here. Uh, everybody that recent. Uh, Thumbs up, thumbs down, doesn't matter. Gets the broadcast out, sends the links, rebroadcast. Uh, appreciate all of that. I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature willing. another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, Journey with Purpose.
up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. 